So I've still got my snake program in here, my run backwards and forwards snake program. We'll take it to 20% to start with, just start it off nice and easy. Let's just try and block out some light there. And you can probably see something just moving around, a little dot moving around on that silver bit there. Now whether it should be doing that I don't know. But the first thing I can do is just check whether there's something coming out of the laser which I can easily do like this. One, two, three, four, five. Yep. Just check that again. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a nice deep burn. So we'll now run it at 60% and just see what the mode burn looks like initially. So let's have a check, see what 60% looks like. One, two, three, four, five, six. Look at that, nearly, nearly all the way through. And again, a nice conical burn. Probably go up to 90% and see what that looks like. Right, so we'll take a look at the beam when I turn on 90% power. Oh, it's a lovely pink beam. Let's take a look at a mode burn. I'm anticipating some flames this time. It's lost a little bit of its shape, but it's still got a good center to it. Before I run my calorimeter tests, um, I ideally want to keep the nozzle on and have the beam focused so that it's a direct comparison with what I did yesterday. But at the moment, remember, I've just set my laser tube up. How do I know that all my mirrors are still aligned? Well, I can go right to the end of the system and check that the beam is coming through the nozzle OK. Now, there's a very simple way that I do that. I'm not so sure that it's the recommended way, but I use a piece of softwood and I bring the table up until the softwood is touching almost. And now I put a little bit more pressure on it. A little bit more pressure on it and twist it. And as you can see, it's twisting underneath the nozzle and what it's doing, it's leaving an impression of the nozzle there. I can take it up a shade more, put a little bit more pressure on it. And now I'm just going to do a pulse test. Here we go. We'll drop, now we we'll drop the table down. Hopefully you can see the impression of the nozzle there. And you can see that my burn dot is more or less in the center. In other words, I don't need to do any fiddling and adjustment with my mirrors. If you remember, we're agitating the water to keep a fairly even um, temperature throughout our mass of half a, half a kilogram. And we're checking the temperature every one minute. So I'm not going to bore you with loads of calorimeter tests. I'm just going to move straight on and we'll take a look at some of the initial results. Now this is a piece of 8mm acrylic um, with the previous tube. Um, you can see that it cut somewhere in the region of probably 7mm and the last millimeter was very rough and it didn't really cut through. Um, and that was running at probably only 2 or 3 millimeters a second and it didn't quite make it through. Let's compare that with one that I've just done with the new tube and first of all you'll see that the edge is now crystal clear and you can see right through we can see right through to the other side of the block and I then cut another one so that I could use the clarity of the edge to see different mode burns and the first mode burn that I was going to show you is this one at the bottom here which is 20% it's a nice crisp conical shape that goes in probably about four millimeters. Right, the next one here was done at 60% and if we take a look at that you'll see that it's not quite as conical but the center has pierced through a long way and in fact it's virtually blown out of the bottom there, hasn't quite. Then we went on to 80% next, 
And that was a bit of a surprise. Because although it was quite deep, it probably went to seven, maybe six or seven millimetres in, rather than the 60%, which was virtually the whole eight millimetres. And then finally, we went to the 95% next, and we find that we're probably only going in again six millimetres, and the difference between 80% and 60% is little difference. And in fact, I would say that 60% is cutting deeper and more in a more penetrating way than 80%. So I find that quite an interesting result. This was the first test square that I cut, and I cut this at 95% and it was two millimetres a second. Now once I'd looked at these results, I wondered if backing the power off to maybe 60% or even 70% would give me better results. So I backed the power off to 60% and it absolutely breezed through this test square at two millimetres a second. I don't think there's anything wrong with the machine. I think it's just a characteristic that probably we're going to have to live with. And I'm very, very happy that I can cut through eight millimetre perspex with 60% power. If 60% actually represents 50 watts, I don't mind. Now, I have heard other laser users a report that they don't need to run above about 85% um, because there's no benefit to running anymore and well maybe this proves the point that possibly I've got my full power at 60, 65% and I don't need to worry anymore provided I get consistent results and they last which these seem to be doing because after I'd done my um, calorimeter tests Every time I did a calorimeter test, um, at the end of 15 minutes, I did a mode burn. And my mode burns came out as good at the end of the tests as they did at the beginning of the tests. So that's the key thing for me now. I've got a machine that runs consistently and reliably. So despite the hassle, I think it's probably been worth the uh, £200 to get my machine back in good working order. So I'll just take this opportunity to show you what a bad mode burn looks like. Now hopefully if I move this round in the light a little bit you will be able to see that there is a cone coming up towards you in the middle of that cone that's going away from you. There's an inverted cone that's in the bottom there and the depth of the cut as you can see is barely three millimeters maximum. So there's just no power in the center of that beam. The real world properties of my new laser tube seem to um, be pretty good. It's passed some quick, brutal and dirty tests and uh, it seems to have fared quite well. But I also did several hours of work with the machine firing its laser into my calorimeter. I'm not going to claim that my test methods would uh, pass any proper scientific scrutiny, uh, but they were never planned to. They were just designed as means of collecting data that I can use to assess patterns. My calorimeter, for example, it's very crude, but provided I use it consistently, um, the results I get will all be relative to each other, which is the important thing. If I needed absolute results out of it, I would have had to track down a real factor for the absorption of CO2 radiation by water. And to be honest, I can't find that information anywhere. There are vague phrases around like, it's quite high, that's not exactly going to help me with any calculations. For the purposes of my calculations, I've always assumed that factor to be 100%, i.e. all the energy fired into the water by the laser beam will be absorbed and turned into heat. Now that may well not be true. It's a consistent value and that's all I'm interested in. The pattern won't change even if the factor changes. So let's take a look at the results of my calorimeter tests. Now I must point out before we start looking at these graphs, I've put some separation in the start points so that you can see what the patterns are. Starting at the bottom, the 20% the graph shows that over a period of 15 minutes, we might have had something like about one or two degrees of temperature rise. 
regardless of what the start temperature was, we still had two degrees of temperature rise. And then switched on more power, and as we expected, we got a higher temperature rise over a period of time. And you can see that it went up nice and steadily and smoothly. Similarly for the 60 and the 70 percent. One thing I'd like to point out is that there's very little difference between the temperature rise at 70 percent than there was at 60 percent. And in fact, when you look at the 90 percent black line, you'll find that, well, it's even possible that the red line on average is either parallel or slightly better than the 90 percent. The reason why we've got two 90 percents is that I wanted a, to show a relationship um, because one or two people had mentioned to me that I ought to be taking the lens and the, and the nozzle off and firing the beam directly into the water. So my argument was that um, it didn't make any difference because the lens was already about 70 millimeters above the water and it was well and truly defocused anyway. The difference between the mauve and the black line is virtually nil and so you know having the lens in or having the lens out makes virtually no difference. Several people had mentioned to me before I uh, decided to buy a new tube that I possibly might have a problem with my power supply and that it was the power supply that was tailing off and losing its power as time went on. Well I think when we look at these um, results from my new tube you can clearly see that there is no degradation with time. If I was losing power from the power supply then at least one or two of these higher powered curves would start flattening off as they got towards pay maybe 10, 11, 12 minutes. No sign of that. So I think my power supply has been exonerated and I think these graphs show that I've got a very nice new laser tube that's working well. Now these graphs show the temperature rise in 500 grams of water over a period of time which is 15 minutes. Now there is absolutely no doubt that that temperature rise is that temperature rise and it requires a certain amount of power to make the water rise by that temperature. Uh, that's a scientific fact and so my calculations um, work out how much power has been absorbed by the water to raise the temperature by each of these graphical amounts. Now I know that I've got a brand new tube and I also know that it's working extremely well because of the physical tests that I've carried out on the laser. When I did my output wattage calculations um, they came out quite low. So what I've done is used a CO2 absorption factor of about 0.5. Now the result of that is that it has doubled my calculated figures and brings it up close to something that's near the real world. So if I set the output to 95% of its capable power, 95% of 50 watts is about 45 watts. And so when I apply this 0.5 factor to my calculations, this is the graph that I finish up with. Now whether the scale down the side runs 0 to 50 or 0 to 25 without my fiddle factor in it, the picture will remain the same. It's just that I've brought it into the real world so that I can point out to you that at 60 or 65 percent along the bottom axis we get about 40 watts. We can go up to 90 percent and we still only get another 3 watts of power generated. It's hardly worth winding the wick up from 60 to 90 for a very very small percentage gain. So I hope that I've been able to show you that um, you can draw some useful conclusions from patterns rather than from absolute data. Well I think it's time to wind up this session now and I do hope that uh, all the lessons that I've learnt could benefit some of you guys out there if you find yourself in a similar situation. So thanks again for watching.